All right, Paul. So Kepler has had its three-year mission. It's gone and taken all this data. Unfortunately, its uh, mission has ended about the time they thought it was going to. Uh, normally, these missions go a little longer than that. You try to uh, get more out of them than you intended. But these reaction wheels that allow it to point precisely in the sky, they're sort of like giant gyroscopes, have broken. Two of them have broken, so it can't do that anymore. So what have we learned? Well, from the ground, you can only get, say, 0.1% precision. So you can only see a planet that blocks out 0.1% of the light of the star. So its area is 0.1% of the area of the star, radius the square root of 0.1%. So that, those are big guys. These are big guys. Um, yeah. These are going to be things the size of you know, Jupiter, Saturn, gas giant planets. So the hope with Kepler was because it can get to much higher precision, it can see much smaller dips and therefore could see smaller things. So that's the question, what lurks out there that's smaller than the gas giants? Right, so in our own solar system, it's always kind of puzzled me because we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, which are these relatively small rocky planets, which are kind of interesting for living in. And then we got these big monsters, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune out there, which seem completely different. So you sort of have A and B. Now, do we see that same type of thing out there? Yeah, I mean, it always seems to me that it's strange to use the same word planet for both these things because they're so different. I think you should you know, gas giant and rocky crap or something like that. So this is one of the big challenges. Were they going to see the same dichotomy, the same division? Were they going to see a clear break between big things and small things and nothing in the middle? Or maybe in other systems is unusual and maybe there are actually lots of things in the middle. So what they find, well, here's a recent attempt to um, work out all the stuff. What we're plotting here in the top plot is the radius of the planet relative to the Earth. So the Earth would be here. That's about the absolute limit of what you can see. Uh, getting up to you know, Jupiter is about 11 times the radius of the Earth. And what we can see is the number of pl planets at all these different radii. And what you can see is basically small ones drastically outnumber big ones. So these are the ones you've been seeing before, and the small ones hugely outnumber them. But what you can also see is there's kind of no clear gap. Maybe there's a bit of a jump up there, but by and large, you can probably fit one curve through the error bars all the way from here to here. So it kind of looks like the number ramps up steadily from one to the other, or maybe it ramps up even faster than steadily. But there do seem to be huge numbers of things bigger than the biggest rocky planet in our solar system. The biggest rocky planet in our solar system is the one we're living on, the Earth, yep. uh, which is right down the bottom here. So all these things up here, uh, Neptune is 3.8 Earth radius, so the smallest gas giant is there. And what we can see is the vast majority of things Kepler are finding are bigger than Earth, but smaller than Neptune. So they're banging this gap that um, we have in our own solar system. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. That means that maybe our solar system is a little unique uh, in the big picture of things. Although we have to remember that we're not looking out at very large distances here. We're really looking at the inner part of the solar system still. Yes, these are things with periods of up to 50 days. So these yeah. are all much, much closer in than anything in our solar system. You can attempt to do the same thing with mass rather than radius. Kepler, of course, measures how much the light dips, and that's the radius. To get the mass, you then have to go to a very big telescope and measure a spectrum and look for the radial velocity, which they can't do for most of the things found with Kepler. In fact, most of what Kepler finds are never going to get confirmed. There's probably about a 90% chance they're a planet, but there's always a possibility it's some sort of eclipsing binary. They try their best to eliminate them, but without getting spectra with giant telescopes, which is impossible for most of these faint Kepler stars. You're never going to prove it. Yeah, so one of the problems with Kepler, and maybe the only problem I can really think of, is that uh, to make it so they could see 140,000 stars at a time, they had to look at pretty faint stars. And so it turns out faint stars are hard to measure radial velocities because there's just not enough photons arriving at Earth, even with our biggest telescopes, to get those accurate measurements. You do it from mass as well, and um, the radial velocity people have been trying to measure the same thing. Um, They've, to begin with, were finding the larger objects, but as you, as you remember, as they got better and better precision, they started finding smaller ones. The other way they can find smaller ones is to look for smaller stars. If a star is only one-tenth the mass of the sun, then a planet that's ten times smaller can still cause it to wobble by the same amount. And so they're also finding the same thing as the yellow dots here, that the number of planets close in climbs drastically as you go to smaller masses, um, just like smaller radii. So it does actually seem that both sets of observations, um, they've really got very little idea about things down at the Earth mass from the radial velocity, uh, but you know, one or two have been found around really tiny dwarf stars of the highest possible precision, and it's kind of looking like the same picture. Yeah, it is remarkably uh, uh, similar. So it's unusual for things to agree that well, given that we're doing things in very different ways here. So yeah. 
that seems to be, uh, we have a pretty good idea what's happening. Yeah. So these things have been coined super Earths. Maybe they should be called mini Neptunes. Um, super Earth sounds a bit sexier, I guess. And so the idea is what are all these things we don't have any analogues like in our own solar system? Bigger than the Earth, smaller than Neptune. And so we're calling them super Earths. Maybe they're rocky planets like the Earth, just bigger. Well, we can, I think it seems to me we have the right type of information to look at this further because we have mass and we have radius. So presumably that's going to be able to tell us a bit more about what they're made out of. Yes, yeah, so this is the question. Are they actually your mini Neptunes, so gas giants smaller than anything we see, or are they rocky planets bigger than anything we see? Well, what you can do is plot the mass. This is for ones which have the radial velocity measurement, which is only a very tiny fraction of the Kepler yep. ones, because it needs huge amounts of big ground-based telescope spectroscopy time, and uh, the planet radius and Earth radii. Um, so this is our own solar system. That's Venus and Earth, uh, Uranus and Neptune, Saturn and Jupiter, as you go up here. And what you can see is all these dots, or all the different things measured, um, by, which have both radial velocity and transit measurements, whether from Kepler or from the ground. And what they've plotted here is theoretical models for what you expect for different sorts of material. So if it's hydrogen, you'd expect it to sit on this line over here. So as the mass gets bigger, it gets bigger and bigger until this point, the hydrogen is so heavy that if you add more mass, it actually makes it just compress, like we were talking about earlier, that idea of having a pile of pillows. You put more weight on top of a pile of pillows, things actually start going down. And this is where they start to end up eventually turning into stars if you make them too yeah. massive. And here is a planet that was made entirely of water, one entirely of rock, and entirely of iron. Clearly, an iron planet is going to be smaller at a given mass because it's got a higher density. Right, and so when you do these models, it's really a matter of figuring out how the gas or the rock or water behaves as you put more of it. It, it exerts pressure, it pushes back, and different things push back differently. Um, but of course, gravity always cares about how much mass there is. So gravity is really just related to the radius and the mass. And so mm -hmm. you can put this all together, and these models are actually pretty secure. They're things we can sort of test here on Earth. And so we really do know what a ball of hydrogen is mm -hmm. going to do. Yeah, one thing you can see is if you look at the um, Saturn and Jupiter, they lie near the hydrogen line. Whereas Uranus and Neptune actually, while they look like gas giants from the outside, actually lie nearer the water line. And in fact, people in our own solar system would call them ice giants rather than gas giants. While they have the gaseous atmosphere on the basis of their density and radius, they're probably made mostly of a thick ball of ice with a thin layer of gas on the surface of them. And these new planets, where are they sitting? Well, some of them are down here around the rocky ones, but only the very smallest. And then there's almost a continuous progression. Uh, rocky ones, iron ones, uh, up to water ones, which may well be ice ones, um, and then a sort of gap in the middle, and then it jumps up to hydrogen ones. So there are a few things in the middle all the way but through. these little guys down here, they really do look like super Earths. They really look like giant analogs of Earth. They're as dense. They're probably going to have iron cores and rocky mantles. And uh, so, except for being really, really close to their stars, and so presumably pretty hot, um, they look like at least something that we are used to living on. Yes, it looks like we've got a range. One thing that's caused a lot of interest is ones lying near this line, which is quite a lot of them, uh, the idea that these actually might be water planets. So what we know is the radius and the mass. Unfortunately, there's more than one way to get the same radius and mass. So right. you can have two possible ideas. Uh, one is you've got something like an iron core, uh, then rocks. This is iron, magnesium, silicates, various things that we would call rock, and then a rather thick layer of water. On the Earth, we have your uh, iron core, uh, 6,000 kilometers of rock, and on average, maybe a couple of kilometers of water. Right. Whereas here, we're talking maybe 1,000 kilometers of water. So this would be a very, very deep ocean. Um, and then uh, hydrogen helium gas up there. Or it could be you get rid of the hydrogen helium and actually just have water all the way, just a little bit of hydrogen at the end, once again around an iron and a, a rocky core. And both these things can give um, things that lie around this line over there. And we expect it really to be water and not ice, because these things are in, in the solar system. Is, it, is that enough to make it water as opposed to the well, gas Well, probably giants? it's got some bits of water. It's very, very hot, presumably. Yeah. But actually, the pressure is so intense um, that even at the high temperatures, it's going to be solid. So it's hard to imagine hot ice. But if you put the, enough pressure on, water will turn into a solid even at very high temperatures. Okay. So quite what form it's in. It's probably got water layers somewhere in it. But uh, in the middle, it's a, a form of H2O is like nothing we see on Earth. 